Hello, students of statics. This is Dr. Dan Baker. Today's video, we're going to start talking about screws. Okay, so this is in the friction chapter of statics, and so we'll get into friction here shortly. But first, I want to talk about screws. I know that all of you, likely even today, have done something with a screw thread. It might have been opening your shampoo in the shower. It might have been you open a cap on your peanut butter on any of your food items that actually has a right-hand threaded screw. And so I'm going to show you how you can use the um, right hand rule in order to determine which way you should rotate a screw. Now, I think that all of you probably are very used to this idea of, some of us call it righty tighty, lefty loosey. Um, and that's when you're looking at the head of a screw or bolt. So looking in this direction here, that if you turn that screw, righty tighty is looking at the top of that screw. So to the right hand side, this way, this would be to tighten the screw. And of course, in the opposite direction would be to loosen the screw. Okay, so that's really convenient if you're looking at the top of a screw. But what happens if you're looking at it from the side, if it's wrapped around the back side of an object, right, that you're trying to assemble or disassemble? So this is where the right hand rule comes in. All right. So as you look at righty tighty and lefty loosey or right tight and left loosen, if you wrap your fingers in the direction of loosen, okay, so wrapping them in the direction of this arrowhead right here, your thumb should come out of the screen. Okay, what that's showing, your thumb is showing the direction of the motion of that screw or bolt. Okay, it's coming out toward you. If you want to tighten it, basically pushing it down into the screen, you flip your hand over, thumb goes into the screen, fingertips line up, right hand fingertips line up with this tight arrow, and your thumb goes into the screen. Okay, so that kind of confirms that this works for right, tight, left, loosen. If we have a screw that's in the plane of the page, let's look at this one over here. If you want to push that screw downwards, Okay, so you basically push your thumb down along the screw and it shows you want to rotate that screw in a direction basically where this side over here is going to come toward you around the front. Okay, so that would show you how you can use your fingertips and your thumb with your right hand to show the direction to tighten that screw. And conversely, if you want to remove this screw, then you want it to move upwards. Okay, so upwards, you flip your thumb around going upwards and you basically would rotate that screw around in the direction of your fingertips and that would be to loosen that screw. Now you may be wondering, I mentioned this works for all right hand threaded screws. Both of these are right hand threaded. And I would say that greater than, I don't know, 97, 98% of screws in the world are right hand threaded. We really only use left hand threaded screws when we have to. Okay, so right hand is definitely um, the standard. So if you look at the threads holding up a screw, and it doesn't matter if you're holding it with the, the head down or the head up, but if you're looking at those threads and look on the right hand side, if these threads are higher on this side, that means that this is a right hand thread. Okay, so basically higher on right. we have right hand threaded. If it is higher on the left, then it is left hand threaded. Okay, so um, so these are, I don't wanna highlight the left side here because these are not left hand threaded, but you could basically flip any of these images and you'd see that that would change it physically from a right hand thread to a left hand thread. So you can't just, you know, you can't flip a screw over and I challenge you to do this, find a screw. And like I said, it even could be the threads on your shampoo bottle or your peanut butter container, or for that matter, your toothpaste tube. Um, and if you take a look at that and look at it from the side, you'll see that the threads are higher on the right hand side. Therefore it is right hand threaded. All right. Moving on now to develop some equations that relate the friction of a screw to the moment which that screw needs to basically start moving, okay? So one thing to highlight before we even get started is as we're talking about friction, um, for screws, we're talking about impending motion friction. Okay, so all friction, which we talk about in the entire screw section, will be in pending motion. We're not actually going to get into kinetic, and we're also not going to have static, but not impending. 
Okay, so um, that's a good thing. You guys are probably more used to impending motion coming out of physics anyway. Um, and it turns out that impending motion is going to be kind of the governing case where all of our equations will be developed around that uh, for the rest of the friction chapter. Okay, so it's really only blocks and wedges, um, slipping and tipping, those two topics, which we'll have to consider what friction state is it in. Um, here we can talk about impending motion. But one of the joys about screws is we have some kind of new friction states that relates to um, the balance of the screw friction to the load on the screw. And we'll get into those as we move forward. All right, so if we think about what is a screw, there's multiple different kinds of screws. Now here in statics, we are going to focus on square threaded screws. Now, square threaded screws are most commonly used for like power transfer. Uh, it also just makes the geometry easier, right? So if you look at a screw, which would be like to fasten two boards together, um, then you end up with a profile that would look something like this, right? Where you have this like tapered screw angle, okay? And then you have your next thread and they're often really, really close together, but you have another tapered angle like this. Okay, so a square threaded is going to be a similar kind of cross section except for the faces on the screw are going to be um, kind of flat as opposed to tapered. Okay, so this is square out here. versus being tapered. Now, one of the reasons that most of our screws that we see are tapered is you can actually roll those threads in where most square threads, to my knowledge, I think you have to machine them in. Okay, so it's fundamentally a different process to create those screws. Um, but it also, we're able to align our normal forces on the faces of those screw threads kind of in the axial plane of the screw. Okay, so um, this is our square, contrasting square and taper threads. And if you think about what is a square threaded screw, it's really just a wedge wrapped around a cylinder. Okay, so basically you can see in the picture right here, here is this wedge and it's just wrapped around this gray cylinder. And if we unwrapped it, we can see that it has an overall length, which is the circumference of that cylinder, two pi r. And it has a vertical height over here, which we're calling L. We call this the lead of the screw. Now this lead is closely related to the number of threads per inch. Um, if you're using US customary, which is often indicated as TPI. So there's often, it's usually an even number, 10, 24, 14, 16 threads per inch. And then the last thing we'll show on here is this angle. So this angle here is the thread angle. Now I often will use alpha instead of theta. And the thread angle fundamentally is just like a wedge angle of a wedge. Okay, it's just a difference from horizontal to the face um, of that thread. All right, so I think that gets us started and I mentioned the impending motion, so we're all set there. So if you take a look at this triangle, it turns out that we can relate these three terms. We can relate the base of this triangle, which is the circumference, the lead of the triangle, which is its height, and also this angle, interior angle, and so really what we're doing here is we're bringing this down, we're creating a right triangle. Once we have a right triangle, we know we can use our friend sine, cosine, and tangent. And because we don't have the hypotenuse length, we're going to use tangent. And so we can write that the tangent of alpha is equal to the lead L over two pi R. Okay, so that gives you a working equation where you can relate your thread pitch, your lead, and your circumference. Now, um, the circumference is based upon the radius, and let me just put a note over here that this R, we often call this the mean or average radius.
And so technically, instead of that being like the radius of the cylinder or the radius of the outside of the threads, it's really kind of like the radius halfway between the cylinder to the outside threads. Okay, so it's the middle of the thread. Okay, so now let's go ahead and derive some equations that enable us to relate loads on screws to the moments it takes for that screw to reach impending motion. So for all these examples, let's think about the simplest type of automotive jack that you could create. Maybe you create this um, in your garage at home, maybe you're in, um, in the mech lab, but let's just say that you weld or create a metal frame Okay, and so this is designed basically to go on the ground and that you just thread a nut and weld it onto here, either the, the top or thread it into the body and essentially put your screw inside of, we'll go with blue for the screw. Okay, so you put this bolt or screw. Now I'll use bolts and screws kind of interchangeably just because they, the threads on them act in the same way. Now I'm not gonna draw every individual thread, but this will be right-hand threaded, okay, higher on the right. So my threads slant up in that direction. Okay, so there is my bolt. And so what we're gonna think about in this context is that you've created this frame and this bolt as a car jack. Okay, there's no mechanical advantage to this car jack besides the screw itself. So we're first going to talk about the context to raise the direction, to raise a car. Okay, so I'm going to use these dotted brown arrows for my motion. Okay, the motion of the screw, and this one is to raise the car up. And then if you think about if this is going to raise a car up, that car is going to be pushing downward on the screw. And so this is going to be our load. Okay, so we're going to have a motion of a screw and also a load on that screw. Now from the right-hand rule, you should be able to look at this system and say, hmm, well, if I want to raise it, I want to find thumb in the direction of this brown arrow, your right-hand thumb. And therefore, my moment to rotate this screw will wrap around this direction here. Okay, so that'd be my applied moment. So let's zoom in on this screw, and I'm going to draw just a couple of threads and the same, um, the motion and the load. Okay, so here again is my screw. I'm going to blow this thing up. Here is my tapered thread, or excuse me, my square thread. Got that overlapping there a little bit. That'll work. Okay, so this is my bolt head. And let's try one more thread down here. All right, and noticing that the, the bolt would continue down with more and more threads kind of going down the page. And so if we take a look at one single element of this bolt head, okay, so one small little element. Now let me go ahead and add my other applied things. So here's my load W. I'm going to add a moment to this bolt in order to have it reach impending motion. Okay, so this is by like impending upward motion. And again, just to note on here, and this is more of a kinetic term, we'll talk a little more about kinetic terms, motion terms, we get into dynamics, but this is the impending motion. Okay, is an upwards impending motion. All right, just add a couple of dimensions here. We do have that this is my thread pitch alpha. Um, we talked about the mean radius. So the mean radius is gonna go from the middle here out to the middle of these threads. Okay, so if this is our center line. It's gonna go from here out to, like I said, halfway there. So there would be my mean radius R. And then my thread pitch, excuse me, not my thread pitch, but my lead, my distance between threads. You can pick either the top of the thread, the bottom of the thread, the middle of the thread. Um, they're all gonna be one lead length apart, L. Okay, 
So on this element, um, let me go ahead and bring down the center line because it becomes a valuable reference point. All right, so as we think about a normal force, right? Normal force being perpendicular to a surface, okay? So we're gonna have perpendicular to the thread pitch. And so this would basically be the normal force that's coming from the frame, right? On this one single element of this thread. And so this is the normal force. Now, all normal forces, right? If we have a thread pitch of alpha right here, it's gonna turn out that this angle here between vertical and normal is also going to be alpha. And that just has everything to do with the normal force being perpendicular to the thread. So therefore, while this alpha is from vertical, this alpha is from horizontal, right? That flip horizontal to vertical gives us perpendicular angles to perpendicular lines. Okay, if we think about the friction, the friction is going to um, resist the motion, okay? And the rotational motion in this case comes from this moment. And so the friction in this case is actually going to come back. I'll just draw it up here. Back in this direction here would be my thread friction on that one single element. Okay, so if I take my friction and my normal, it turns out that I can create a friction resultant force. Okay, I'm going to draw this with a dotted line just to emphasize that we wouldn't want to add the friction, the normal, and also our F sub R, our friction resultant force. Actually, let me flip this around. Let me go with um, R sub F, okay, the resultant force based upon friction. Um, just a semantics thing, but so with that R sub F, we also know from our friction angle, right, going back to the first section of friction, that the angle between normal and that resultant force is our friction angle phi sub s. Now again, phi sub s can only be used in impending motion friction, but hey, we have impending motion friction on this problem. All right, so that gives me the different elements. So what we can do now is we can write some equations. Okay, and so all of these are going to be, or a couple of them are going to be four the element. Okay, so this element we're talking about is this little element that I shaded gray. And so for this element, we could write an equation that said the amount of moment for just this element, okay, so like a dm, um, which is the moment just to overcome the forces on that element, is equal to r sine. Now this sine is coming in because fundamentally we want to end up with a, let me map this out here. So we're, we're really looking at creating a triangle. Let me draw this in green. Okay, so there it's hypotenuse is going to be R sub F, horizontal coming over here, vertical, vertical coming along the center line. This is a right triangle. And so the angle up here in this corner, let me just draw alpha in a little smaller. Okay, so this angle, still alpha. So the angle across this corner is the combined total of alpha plus V sub S. Okay, and so as we think about um, finding the amount of moment it comes over to resist this, the moment's coming around the center line. Right, and so if it's coming here on the center line, it's only gonna be the horizontal component of R sub F that actually creates a moment. And it's gonna be the horizontal component times the mean radius, right? Because a moment is a distance times a force. So the force is gonna be the horizontal component right here. The radius is going to be little r. Okay, so keep those in mind as we're writing this equation. So there's my little r. So that's my radius, and so then my force is equal to the sine of alpha plus phi sub s times my friction resultant R sub f. Okay, so again, this is my horizontal force. And this is literally, it's labeled R, but this is my R distance from the center line. And I know that R times force is equal to moment, okay? And of course, we're just talking about a dm because this is only the amount of force which is on our little element. 
So if we add together all of our uh, moments around every single element, okay, so this is um, for full one wrap of a thread. Noting that in this in this analysis, we're really just assuming that one thread is engaged at a time. Okay, now if and that would depend on the precision of your screw, but in this analysis, we're just going to go with one single thread. Okay, and so if we're going to have a sum of our moments, right, a total moment that's going to take to raise this car up, that is going to be equal to the same radius r. So this part doesn't change. Our sine of phi sub s. Um, actually, let me put it in the same order I did before. So sine of alpha plus phi sub s. And this is going to be the sum of all our r sub f's. Okay, so on for every single element all around one full wrap of a thread. Now, the other thing we can do, because we still have too many unknowns to solve for here, is that we can go ahead and sum forces in the y direction. And let me note here, this is technically sum of moment is equal to zero, because this is actually an equilibrium equation, because we're talking about reaching impending motion. Okay. And so another equilibrium equation in the y direction, we have our weight force coming down, minus w. And then we're going to add to that the sum of all of my r sub f's. Now, this is going to be the vertical component. Okay, so if the horizontal was sine of alpha plus p sub s, this is going to be the cosine of alpha plus p sub s. And again, that's going to equal zero because it is an equilibrium equation. So, what I'll notice in these equations is actually two unknowns. Okay, so one of my unknowns is the sum of moments. And technically, as I've written it here, like this, um, this is my sum of moments, the total moment to get that screw to move. The other unknown, which I don't know, is the sum of all of these r sub f's. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation here, and I'm going to solve it for r sub f. I'm going to take this equation here. I'm going to solve it for r sub f. And then I'm going to set the r sub f's equal to each other and solve for my moment. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all those steps here explicitly step by step, but that's where the derivation is going. Again, solving both equations for r sub f and setting them equal to each other. We end up with, and noting here, I'm just going to, to simplify the notation on this. I'm just going to call this my moment. And um, so instead of sum of moments, it's just the moment I need to apply to the screw or bolt head. Okay, so this moment M is equal to W R, the tangent of the sum of this angle, alpha plus phi sub s. So this is my working equation, which gives me the amount of moment to overcome fundamentally the load plus the friction in order to raise the car with my super simple jack. Okay, so the way that we typically discuss um, the relationship here between my load and my impending motion is I'm gonna call this against. Okay, so we could say here that the motion, let's put it in abbreviation form, I am, your impending motion, is against your load. Now, some books like to talk about it with raising and lowering, but that's going to be assuming that you always have a vertical downward force. Screws aren't always interacting with the vertical downward force, so I like this idea of against and with. Your impending motion is against your load, and so that's going to be the criteria that this equation was written for. So this is your impending motion against W. Your load W. And again, just to note that all these moments we'll talk about are at impending motion. So this is the moment 
to reach upward impending motion. Any additional moment, and you'd have a kinetic system. Okay. So it turns out that that's the easiest case for screws. Um, and it's the easiest case because we're just simply adding up that alpha plus V sub S um, any time that our impending motion is against the load. But what about, and say you're, you're using this jack to change the tire on your car, what happens when you're done changing the tire on your car and you want to lower it down, right? If you've used jacks before, you realize you have to put some kind of a moment applied to that jack. And so we're going to talk about essentially as we have our motion going with the load, we need to worry about the relationship between alpha and phi sub s. Okay, so that's going to be our next, next section right here. Again, the sole top section is impending motion is against the load. So now moving down below here, we can say that this is for um, impending motion with the load. Okay, and the kind of wording that you see with these kind of problems is going to be to lower, okay, so to lower something, to um, remove a force, right? So that would be more kind of in the context of clamping, right? So if you've tightened a clamp, you're gonna be going against the load. If you're removing a clamp, so let me actually just put that in terms of a, removing a clamp. Any time that you're basically backing a screw away that has a load on that screw, um, you're often gonna be going impending motion is with the load, okay? So the three cases we have for impending motion with the load. Okay, I mentioned that when you have your impending motion against, it's the simplest, you have one equation. If you have your impending motion with the load, you have three cases. The first case, number one, is called self-locking. So in a self-locking state, turns out we have more friction as represented by phi sub s than we have thread pitch alpha, okay? More friction than thread pitch. And you can really think about this thread pitch as being analogous to your quote load, okay? It's not the load w, but at least in these equations, that angle alpha, basically a steeper thread gives you more loading on that section of screw thread than a, than a flatter thread, right? So that kind of tells you that um, the, the load W and the thread pitch interact. But in this context, we can basically think about this one as friction, B sub S. So we have more friction than load. And so if you have more friction than load, the screw is simply going to sit there unless you add a moment. Okay, so this is actually a really good place to design screws is with self-locking. And so the moment to remove a screw, to get it moving downward, to get it moving basically in the direction of the load, we put M prime, because it's a different moment than your one above. This is going to be the same form, WR, tangent, now this is going to be the difference of phi sub S minus alpha. Okay, so the only difference we have here is that if you're going impending motion against a load, basically to raise a load up, we're gonna to add together the angles, and here we're gonna take the difference between those two angles. Now, as we think about the direction of the motion, okay, and so let me zoom out here a touch, I think I can put the diagrams right next to us. So if we think about just drawing a simple, um, Let's go with one screw thread here. All right, so this moment for self-locking, right? So we basically want this screw to go downward, right? So we can show here with the dotted line that we want our impending motion to go in the same direction as our load W, 
Okay, let's still draw our center line on here. Our normal force will still be perpendicular. It is always perpendicular. Okay, so there is my normal force. My friction force is going to resist the motion of the moment, and that moment is wrapping around in this direction. Okay, so this is my m prime, opposite my m from my previous equation. And the friction I would develop here is basically along this surface. So this would be my friction, therefore projecting this out with the parallelogram rule, we find that the sum of these two, let me keep with this idea of kind of a long dotted line for my R sub F. Okay, so my resultant friction force. And again, I could label these angles. This angle here is going to be always my alpha. And then the angle between my friction and normal, let me extend this guy out, is going to be um, always phi sub s. And so fundamentally, phi sub s minus alpha gives us this little wedge right here. Okay, so let me call that star. Okay, so this angle here is angle star. Figuring out how far r sub f is basically past vertical. Um, and that gives us again the horizontal component of that friction resultant force, which then leads into the amount of moment we need to overcome self-locking friction and lower the car. Okay, so let me just write that here. This is the moment to overcome self-locking to lower the car. All right, moving on. If we don't have enough friction to keep the car from moving after you've raised it up into place, we have a condition called unwind with load. And that turns out where we have phi sub s is less than alpha. Okay, we have more load than we have friction. And so our equation, very similarly, m is equal to w, our load, times our mean radius, times the tangent now of alpha minus phi sub s, noting that we've flipped those around. So now to draw that diagram, here is my thread pitch, or my thread. My load is still coming downwards. My impending motion is still coming downwards. Now this moment is to hold the screw in place. Okay, so if you designed your jack, right, your super simple jack, in the condition where it was gonna unwind by itself, you'd have to have a friend sit there and hold the wrench while you were changing the tire on your car. Not very safe, not very efficient. Right, much better to have a self-locking case where you can let go of the wrench, walk away, um, drink a cola, and then come back and finish your project. Okay, so here again, draw your center line, add your normal force perpendicular to that thread. Here is your thread pitch alpha. Now this um, moment is going to be in the same direction it would actually be to raise the jack up, raise your car up. We're gonna call this M double prime because we're holding this in place. And so here for this condition, we need to zoom in here a little bit because we're gonna have kind of a, a tight, we have a little amount of friction. Okay, so we have a little amount of friction here. And our, I'm gonna draw with a skinnier line so I can fit it in here. Our resultant force, R sub F, using our parallelogram law, ends up between vertical and our um, normal force. Take a look in the textbook for a little bit better drawing of this. I actually um, drew one out with SBGs. Okay, so if we think about these angles again, we have that um, 
phi sub s is always between um, both gray. Okay, phi sub s is between r to n, and alpha is between vertical to n. And so in this one, we have this little wedge right here that's going to be basically, I'll call this star prime. And so this difference is our star prime. So again, using, like I said, the same kind of construct and we can draw free body diagrams and think about like how those forces look. Uh, moving on, we have one more case. This is actually the simplest of the three. Number three, the case is we are at impending motion. So if we are at impending motion, it turns out that our only equation tells us that phi sub s is equal to alpha. Now this would not be a very stable case because if we added any more load, if we decreased our friction, if you change your temperature, which also then is related to friction, then it could start unwinding by itself. It may get self-locking, okay? So not the best design case. Self-locking is certainly the most stable. And so fundamentally here we have M triple prime is equal to zero. We don't need to add a moment if it's already sitting at impending motion. What that looks like with our drawing here is that we have uh, our loading W, our impending motion still is downward impending motion. Our center line is still useful for looking at our normal force as well as our phi sub s, or sorry, this is our alpha. And then our r sub f turns out to be vertically along the center line. Okay, so there's our friction, there's our r sub f. There's the extension lines for our parallelogram law. And still we know that our angle between normal over to r sub f is phi sub s. Okay, so this helps justify that alpha is equal to phi sub s because it's still measuring between the same two lines. They just have to be overlapping each other. Okay, so all of these, like I said, are in a state where we have our impending motion going with our load. We need to compute the difference between the phi sub s and alpha. That will help to determine if it's self-locking, it's unwind by self or add impending motion. And then you can use various equations to solve for your moments to push the system to impending motion. And again, all of these impending motion cases here, here, and here are going to be impending motion downward. Okay, so that gives you kind of a full map of all the different equations that we can use on screws. And I'll come back with an example that shows you how to use these and go through also the analysis of right hand versus left hand threading. Thanks for watching today. 